Welcome to section 16.2. Now this is going to be a very brief video because section 16.2 is not very long. After this video, what you guys will notice is we're going to skip to section 16.10. So in this section, we're going to be talking about liquids and how intermolecular forces influence bulk properties of liquids. So the first thing we want to talk about is capillary action. Now, you guys may have seen this when you guys visited the doctor's office. They do a simple pinprick on your finger and they put this little glass tube right next to it. And all of a sudden what you see is that your blood starts to rise in this little glass tube pictured right here. Now, if you were to take that glass tube and stick it into a glass of water, what you would see is that the water would rise up that tube. And so that's what capillary action is, is the rising of a liquid in a narrow tube. Now to explain this phenomenon, let's take a look at the two chemicals that are working here. The first chemical we should look at is what the glass is made out of. Glass is made out of a matrix of silicon and oxygen. And so SiO2, that's going to be what our glass is made out of. And what you'll notice is my oxygen is more electronegative uh, than my silicon, and so this will have a delta electronegativity of 1.6. So this molecule or your glass wall is highly polar. Next, we can take a look at water. And again, we've already said that water is a polar molecule. So let's go and talk about how capillary action works. So if I have a wall of my glass, and I say that my silicon oxide is polar, what you can imagine is that the wall of the glass is slightly charged and slightly polar, like so. So what can happen here is that the water molecule, which are polar molecules, will be attracted to the walls of the glass. Now, when two different molecules are attracted to each other, we call that adhesive forces. These are due to intermolecular forces, and that's where one charged molecule is, a char is attracted to another charged molecule. Now, not only is the water going to be attracted to the walls of the glass, but water itself is polar, so it is going to be attracted to other water molecules. So when two molecules are attracted to each other, we call that cohesive forces. And what happens is the water starts to build on itself. It sees the new polar spot to that glass. And then we start climbing these water molecules up and up because these attractive forces are going to draw the water molecule up and up. And so that's why I see my liquid start to rise in this glass. Now, if my tube is thin enough, what you guys will see is you'll have two walls where the water's climbing up both walls and it makes this nice little channel for the water molecules to climb on up so it continues to rise in that small glass tube. Now, if the walls are far enough apart from each other, you won't see this phenomenon. You guys can take simple test tubes and you'll note that the water inside is not suddenly spurting out of your test tube. But you will notice that some of these forces are still present. So if we take a look at this picture right here, what you guys will see is I have my charged glass wall and you see that the, the water molecules are kind of creeping up on the side. And what you guys form is you guys form a meniscus. So this is a concave meniscus. And what's happening here is the adhesive forces between the H2O and the silicon are so great, it causes the water to rise up on the sides. Now, if I have something that is nonpolar, like mercury, you'll notice that mercury isn't going to be attracted to the sides of the wall. And instead, what happens with mercury is mercury is going to be attracted to itself. In other words, in mercury, the cohesive forces are greater than the adhesive forces. So what that means is that mercury likes to be with other mercuries, and so they are gonna go ahead and stay away from that wall. And what you'll get is a convex meniscus, or a piling away, trying to stay away from those polar walls. 
or more accurately, the mercury wants to stay with mercury rather than be next to those polar walls. So let's take a look at our first quiz in this mini lecture. I'm gonna ask you, if I take a piece of steel wire, which is super, super dense compared to liquid water, if I take a solid piece of the steel wire and I lay it on top of water, will a steel wire, a solid piece of steel wire, float on top of liquid water? So unfortunately, this is one of the demos that I can't do for you guys. You guys can take a gander at some YouTube videos. And if you're really careful and you can really practice, what you can do is you can take a paper clip and have it float in a glass of water, just like this picture right here. The question is, why does this happen? And what other phenomena does this explain? Now, the reason this happens is a phenomenon called surface tension. Now, surface tension is the reason that whenever you see liquids, they tend to be in spherical droplets or they kind of be in half semispheres if they're laying on a surface. So let's go ahead and think about what's happening here. Now, if I envision my molecules right here, what you'll notice is these molecules will interact with other molecules, or in other words, these molecules are gonna have intermolecular forces with other molecules. Now, the more intermolecular forces it experiences, the better it is for that molecule. That means that it is surrounded by other molecules, they are partaking in intermolecular force contact, and this is going to lower the energy of the system. Now, what they want to do is they want to experience the most intermolecular forces. So these molecules right here at the center of my droplet, they are the best. They are the lowest energy. Every molecule wants to be like this molecule dead center. Now, if that's the case, if I want to go ahead and make sure everything is surrounded, well, what I want to do is I want to lower my surface area and increase my volume. And if we take a look at what shapes do these, these are spheres or half spheres if it's on a surface. What you guys will notice is the molecules at the surface, well, they are the least content. They have the fewest intermolecular interactions. And so to compensate because they don't have so many interactions, they actually tighten themselves together and try to get closer to minimize the energy that they experience. And so what happens here is you get this kind of skin on the surface of liquids where the top molecules, the ones at the surface, try to hug in tighter to each other to compensate for their lack of not being in the center and surrounded by other molecules. Now, because of this, the surface tends to be the strongest. It's almost like there's a skin on top of liquid surfaces. And that's why I can gently rest a paperclip on a glass of water. Now, I should mention, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the stronger my surface tension is going to be. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the last bulk property that is influenced by intermolecular forces, and that is viscosity. Viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to flow. Now, you guys may have done this experiment. If you guys have ever poured a glass of water and compared it to pouring a glass of honey or a glass of syrup, what you'll notice is they pour very differently. The honey pours very slowly. It is resisting that flow. Now, the question is, what is influencing the flow or the viscosity of these two liquids? So what we can do is we can think about this at the molecular level. For a liquid to flow, what I have to have is I have to have the liquids kind of tumble past each other. So if I want the liquids to go from one place to the other, they have to pass another liquid molecule. So if they're tumbling past each other, they're going to interact with each other. So what I want you guys to envision is take a whole basket of tennis balls. And what you wanna do is when you pour the tennis balls, you'll see the balls tumbling past each other. 
Now, tennis balls don't really have any interactions between them. Let's go ahead and say that some of these tennis balls have these Velcro, Velcro strips attached to them. So they'll stick to other tennis balls. Now, if I go ahead and do this, well, if I try to pour those tennis balls with Velcro strips, well, they'll stick to each other. And what's going to happen is they're going to have a harder time tumbling past each other. If they're having a tough time tumbling past each other, well, they're resisting that flow. And so what that means is they'll have a higher viscosity. So the stickier I make my molecules, the higher my viscosity is going to be. Or in other words, the more intermolecular forces that I have, the stronger or higher the viscosity is going to be. Now, there's one other factor that goes ahead with viscosity, and that is if my molecule is complex or long. And so what I'm trying to say is if my molecule can tangle with itself. So tennis balls, they easily roll past each other. But think if instead of tennis balls, we had molecules with little hooks on them. So when they try to roll past each other or flow past each other or tumble past each other, they get hooked and tangle with each other. If that's the case, they'll have a higher viscosity. And things that tend to be really long, well, they tend to have a, a higher viscosity. So if you guys have ever cooked spaghetti, you got these long noodles. And what happens if you try to pour spaghetti? Sometimes the spaghetti gets uh, tangled with each other. And that shows you guys that the spaghetti has this really high viscosity. It's a uh, tough to pour spaghetti versus tennis balls. Well, that's it for this really short section. I hope that made sense and stay safe, Chem1C.